And now, please welcome to the stage the man who's going to tell us which came first, fire or syscalls, Adam Leventhal. Hey, folks. Uh, let me deal with the great problem of computing, making sure my laptop works with the screen. All right, great. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have the kind of ignominious position here of having the least delightful accent you're going to hear maybe all day, but definitely during the morning. You've got all these lovely Italian accents. You've got Brendan speaking strain to us, Australian to us. Um, so you'll have to just suffer through my domestic accent. Um, so um, when I, I was delighted to be invited to give this talk today, and one of the things I love about SysDig, and you already heard this in Loris's talk this morning, is this awareness and respect for the systems that, that came before it. And so I want to go back and, and look at some of the history around system calls and system call tracing to give us a little bit of a context for the day. Um, if you are a reader of academic papers, maybe you can think of this as the related work section of the day. So look at um, system calls and, uh, and how they're traced and also their, their rise to centrality. So I want to give uh, first a little bit of, of background on myself. So um, I'm Adam Leventhal. I'm just one of the co-inventors of Dtrace. Um, has anyone here run Dtrace? Okay, like a few people. Good. Thank you very much for the, for the generous folks who kind of tentatively ran their hands. Like I've seen someone run Dtrace. Um, I also was the co-founder of the ZFS storage appliance team at Sun that was later acquired by Oracle. Uh, more recently, I was the chief technology officer at Delphix. Delphix was some enterprise software, so I'm not going to ask if you folks have heard of it. You probably haven't. Uh, most of our customers were like chief information type um, and uh, chief information officer types. I think that there are probably not very many of those folks in the audience today. Um, but it was the technology building on uh, work we had done in Solaris and ZFS to do fast cloning around large database systems. Um, more recently, I was a uh, entrepreneur in residence at Sutter Hill Ventures. And here, I just want to do a little public service announcement on what that means. People hear that and they think, oh, you're a venture capitalist. And they also think that I'm going to pay for lunch and buy their beer. But it's not, it, I'm not a real venture capitalist. Uh, I think entrepreneur in residence is not like a job, like you guys have jobs, you probably need to show up to a place and like do a thing by a particular time or like someone will get cranky. It's not like that at all. It's, it's much closer to like Silicon Valley welfare. Um, so this is by way to say, if we go out for beers later, please don't be offended when I just chip in for my share and I'm not paying for the full round. Um, I'm also a recent founder in a company, but uh, uh, that happened uh, yesterday. So I'm gonna set that aside for the moment. Um, but um, you know, I started in the Solaris kernel group, and I really think of myself as a kernel guy. Uh, and the, my first exposure to Sysdig was, um, was two years ago, December 2014. Lars had reached out when he built the thing, which I thought was great. Great to have that conversation. He invited me to their first meetup. And Lars, I don't know if you remember this, but at the first meetup, there was a guy in the back of the room who was asking Lars questions. And by way of preamble, he said something like, since kernels are slow and no one uses them anymore, and I think I got whiplash, kind of my, my head spinning around so quickly. And, and Loris kind of like stepped forward like he was concerned that I was going to go after the guy. So I'm saying that more by way um, of, of, so you know, you know, maybe there's some kernel folks in the audience and you should be kind to us and not necessarily think of us exclusively as dinosaurs from, from, from some uh, forgotten era. All right, so uh, on to system calls. What is a system call? I assume all, if not many, if not all of you are familiar, but it's, it's the fundamental way that user land applications interact with the kernel. And in fact, if you're kernel folks, you kind of think of all user land applications, whether they're C or Java or Ruby or Python or whatever, they're kind of just generators of system calls and then they do whatever it is that they're trying to do. But that, that's how kind of everything looks at the level of the kernel. Typically implemented as a trap from user mode into kernel mode. And um, they're mostly standard-ish. So if you kind of wander between Linux and Mac and other things that kind of look in that shape, you'll see open and you'll see read and they mostly work the same. As you start getting into the fringes, you'll see some things that look weird and we'll play with that in just a little bit. But um, they're very, very fundamental to multi-user systems and we certainly take them for granted now. But they've been around since, since the dawn of time, since the dawn of Unix, since the early days of uh, multi-user, multi-processor computing. So I want to walk through that a little bit. So in preparing for this talk, I started looking at what are some of the early 
system call tracing systems. And the first, the, the only thing I could find online was this paper from 1994 about tracing windows. But it cited an earlier paper, a paper that completely apparently unknown to the internet. Uh, but I found someone with it, and so I'm, and I kind of I worked my way through getting it. I won't walk through the, the whole of it. When you're buying me a beer later, you can I'll, I'll give you the story. Um, but I want to walk through this paper. And uh, my apologies, it's a little small, but I'll be I'll be reading this out for the folks in the back of the room. So the paper from 1986, from Unix 1986, is called "A System Call Tracer for Unix." Um, and I just want to walk through a bit of this history because there's, there's some great stuff here. It was done by the Altrix Engineering Group, by Rodriguez in it. Um, anyone even heard of Altrix before? A couple of hands. Okay, great. I know who my, my old schoolers are. So Altrix um, was from DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. Has anyone ever even heard of DEC? Okay, a couple of folks. Great, even more. Uh, DEC merged with, uh, merged with, or was acquired by Compaq. Compaq famously uh, merged with HP. The CEO of Sun at the time described it as the sound of two garbage trucks colliding, which is still just the most spectacular. Of course, went back in his face when Oracle acquired Sun. Um, there was some squelching sound there as well. Okay. So um, another thing I want to point out on the slide, just because it, it is so beautiful, um, DECVAX exclamation point RR. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, great. So this is UUCP. This is in the in the days before, in the in the land before time. This is sort of what email looked like, Unix to Unix copy, and you'll see these exclamation point delimited routing strings. This way that I get one message, a message from one place to the other. And um, forgive the diversion, but I just I think it's 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 so great um, kind of seeing this. And the un, the other great thing about this conference from 1986, Unix 86 was the, not just this paper, which I'm going to go into a little bit, but also all the other stuff. The same author presented a variant of VFS. There was another variant of virtual file system from a Sun presenter. There was a description of Mach, one of the early descriptions of Mach, the, um, the kernel from CMU, architect from CMU. And then at the same conference, there was also this seminal work in mail routing using domain names. So very germane. Glad, I'm glad that this conference happened. Turned out to be pretty important. All right. So at this conference, uh, there was a, 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 or in this paper, there was this observation that system calls and time spent in system calls really matters. And, and you'll have to indulge me, I'm going to read you this quote. Most of the, it, they're talking about profiling techniques. Most of the profiling information is oriented towards the local user functions and not to the calls into the system. This is not a criticism since local user functions is what the user can change, are what the user can change. Uh, however, it does point out an area where a lack of knowledge exists. It is often assumed that system calls are negligible or something not to be worried about. An overabundant use of system calls in many instances can result in havoc just because the programmer didn't know the difference between a system call and a library call. Single user systems don't have to count system calls, but multi user systems do. They have to hoard system calls and treat them with respect since only one system call can be accomplished at a time per CPU. Okay, I love everything about this. Also, if you're getting a little queasy reading this and it looks like maybe I took a picture of it with my cell phone and screwed with it with Photoshop, like there's a reason it looks like that. That's exactly what I did. Um, so my apologies. Okay, but a couple of important points here. Syst this identification of system calls as an important point to look at the system, something that hadn't been looked at before, where spending time in system calls was especially germane. And if you can believe it, that only one system call at a time per CPU could be executed. Obviously not true today, but even more glaring as a point to go look at. Okay, one, one other piece of text, and I promise I won't do this to you again. Uh, consider what information could be in, obtained if the exact time-ordered sequence of calls was given. A complete trace of the algorithm being used to be found in this data. The traditional profile information gives a conglomeration of the user uh, of the usage, pardon me, often masking algorithmic data. The complete trace of the program, however, produces more data than one can imagine. To pare down, this down, consider only a trace of the system calls that a program uses. Although the complete picture is not available, it's often a strong indicator of what's happened. Okay, a couple of things here. Uh, the, the big point here is his observation that system calls are these waypoints. It gives you the right kind of granularity where you can understand more or less what the program is trying to accomplish without getting bogged down in some of the spots in between. It, it is, of course, a very kernel guy way of looking at the world. 
right? That system calls are the way things that matter, and then everything else is just noise in between. Um, but the other great thing is this observation that that tracing everything, a full trace, is more data than could be imagined. Right? It's inconceivable that if you were to log every message all the way through. Uh, a little bit quaint, but still kind of true. Still true that it's it would it would overwhelm you. Okay. So briefly, how this system worked is that if you're the process and you're invoking a system call handler, uh, you can uh, the tracing program can open a new device called dev trace. It creates a buffer into which data goes, and a lot of this might sound familiar. And then uh, if tracing is active, it uh, it then logs that system call into the buffer. It executes the system call and then logs the return values into the buffer. And then later on, the tracing program can go grab the data out of the buffer and present it back to the user. Okay, so um, there's a small disabled cost. Every every system call is now uh, executing a conditional to decide whether tracing is active, but it was the 80s and probably no one cared. Um, so, uh, you know, in, interesting system where you're logging this internal buffer, and of course, very important that you read out the buffer at, at a reasonable frequency and so that the buffer doesn't get lost. But the system also accounts for um, drops in your traces and, and the knowledge that this can be lossy. Okay, this is 1986, and you'll see this mirrored in some of the systems that we're gonna talk about later, and even mirrored in SysDig today. Um, just, again, another quick aside. I think this paper is so phenomenal, and forgive me for like the, the little papers we love vignette uh, inserted into the middle of the CampCon Fest World Expo. Um, but first, this is a Unix, Unix paper. This is ostensibly, ostensibly an academic paper. There's a section called System Call Traces and Fixes, and it says, now for some goodies. And the goodies are traces of unoptimized programs like PS and Last and Head, knowing that the people reading this, they want to see the action. They want to see what actually happened when you trace the thing. The other great thing is there's a line in this paper that says, by accident, I, act I actually traced a CC command. It's kind of like, this is like its blog of its era. Uh, this is kind of, you know, if Twitter existed, he would be tweet storming this thing. But instead, in 1986, it was an academic paper. Um, but uh, just, I, I, I love the idea of, of this Wild West, this frontier of systems research and technology. Um, but part of this, and one of the things they observe in this paper, is that this technique is hard to make secure. You're kind of giving ac people access to look at everything, and in particular, the kind of head scratchingly and this kind of musing uh, format that I'm alluding to um, notices that, well, if you give people access to everything, then they can kind of sniff other people's passwords and that might be a, a negative thing. Maybe we don't want that. So um, this system existed in Ultrix. I'm not sure about the user permissions associated with it. There were variants of it in SunOS, but I think not in Solaris, so uh, gone in, in the late 80s. But that gave rise to trust and to S-Trace, which um, I assume everyone here has run S-Trace, yes? Okay, a couple nods, not even gonna raise your hand for that one. Uh, mm -hmm. But has anyone run Truss on maybe Solaris or some of these other Unix systems? Okay, a couple folks, great. So Truss was developed a couple years later in 1988. And uh, the, the way that was named, I love it, is if your program doesn't work, put it in a Truss. Um, this is from Roger Faulkner, the, the author of, of Truss. Um, and the, it was built on top of this new structured slash proc um, in, in SunOS and Unix. And um, I just want to say that Roger's paper from, from 1991, from Music 91, is a seminal paper in slash proc, and I highly recommend it. Um, and I, I'd also say I had, I had the great honor and pleasure of working with Roger early in my career at Sun Microsystems. Uh, and very sadly, he passed away recently. Uh, and he was just a, a legend of the industry. He, his work lives on. Uh, and I'm very honored to have had the opportunity to work with him. S-Trace came along a couple of years later. Uh, it was also, it, it was billed as an alternative tracer, or alternative tracer for uh, SunOS and then later other Unix systems, and then famously Linux a year later, and then uh, all of the non-Linux code has been excised in, in 2012, so now it's a, a Linux-only type of thing. So contrasting these system call tracers to that first one we heard in Trace in Ultrix in 1996, I want to just walk through how these things work. Because um, I think we've all trust things or 
or S trace things and not kind of appreciated necessarily the machinations that the system is going through. So first, when the process invokes a system call, it triggers a breakpoint, the scheduler stops the process, it wakes up the tracer. The tracer then records the arguments from it. It tells the scheduler to go wake it up. The scheduler stops the tracer, wakes up the process. Process actually executes the system call, does the work of the opener, the read, or, or whatever. Then we stop the process again, wake up the tracer, record the return value, signal the process, stop the tracer, wake the process, and finally we proceed. And we do this for every, every single system call. Um, now I'm gonna kind of stage dive into your hands. Any problems with that people see? Yeah. Right, so to summarize that, massively slow, right? You are, you're causing all these context switches all over the place. Um, and actually stealing from my former colleague, Brendan Gregg, he had his own kind of cheat sheet for, uh, for strace, which I just love. Uh, strace the command, that's how you slow down the target and print the details of every system call. strace minus ppid, you slow down the process and then print the details for each system call. And he kind of goes on like this. So you can hold this up. Uh, you've got in your hands that they give you this morning some strace um, cheat sheets, the comparison between sysdig and strace. I think some of the and slow down the pro or slow down the process is left unsaid in that, but you can read that in from now on. So uh, massively slow. Um, and as a result, it's also basically unsafe to use in production. Has anyone like S traced maybe a database in production or a system in production? Is anyone brave enough to raise their hand and like admit they've done that? Okay, one brave soul in the back. Great. Okay, so um, obviously those people are not to be trusted. Um, <laughs> it's uh, maybe in some limited circumstances, but it's not a production tool. Um, and it's not, it's not designed for production from a performance perspective, certainly. Uh, there's also safety elements where if one of these tracers dies in the middle of it, all of a sudden you can have a, some stray breakpoint that your process is just going to be killed on um, because I've been given the microphone and I get an opportunity to, to vent and I'm getting to be a cranky old man. Uh, I started using Go for a little bit, ran the debugger on it for the first time, and it promptly died and killed off my process, which had been running for six hours. So this is like the, the cardinal sin of diagnostic tools and of frameworks. You can do no harm. Right? If, if, you're, if it is responsible for killing your program or changing its state, it's really bad news. Um, you can also chase the program away, uh, the problem that you're looking at away with S-Trace or Trust. And um, I don't know if folks have seen this. You're seeing some kind of nasty race condition. You run S-Trace, and all of a sudden the problem is fixed, uh, which drives you kind of insane. Um, so, um, it, because S-Trace or Trust are serializing these programs. Uh, in Solaris 11, there was some work to uh, make Trust multi-threaded. So every thread in your program would have a thread in the tracer. So it, it removes some of these effects, but it, it's still, still kind of a mess. And again, useful for, for debugging in development, but not really in production. All right. So now I'm going to transition from the, system, the papers we love talk into maybe a show hacker news section, but I promise I'll be brief. So DTrace is one of the systems that, that I worked on. Um, it's the dynamic tracing framework. We first shipped it in 2003 and 2004 in Solaris. It's now in Mac OS X, FreeBSD, a couple of Linux distros kind of off to the side, but notably Oracle Linux. It's safe by design, to, in, uh, it's safe by design um, for use in production. And this is one of the ways it distinguishes itself from some of these other systems from S-Trace in particular. Um, and its goal is to provide these concise answers to arbitrary questions. In that first system that we looked at um, and in S-Trace, you're mostly getting this fire hose of data. Del uh, D-Trace's goal was to limit the amount of data that you're getting out of the system to only get the, the essence of what you're asking. So not to optimize the channel um, from data collection to data presentation, but, but to optimize at the source so that you're recording only and exactly the data that you want. It's systemic in scope, meaning you can trace everything from Java to IO, and of course to system calls, but system calls are really common place to start. So um, I'm gonna go uh, get out of my slides and go type into a terminal a little bit. So for those of you on Macs, um, I, when I see a lot of like illuminated Apple logos, and um, I assume, I'm, I'm choosing to assume that until this point, 
you've kind of been like me, not un, un, kind of unable to not reload 538 at like a minute by minute basis to check on the election. But, but now you can use it for other purposes too. So if you have your Mac, you can um, S, uh, sudo with me and play with Dtrace a little bit. Folks in the back of the room, um, if, can you see this at all? How about a hand if you can see it? Just at the bottom. Can you see it at the top? Ish, can you read it? Wow, okay, I'll make it even bigger. Great, okay, so we're gonna just do a very little overview of Dtrace, and um, I'm not gonna try it here, but I think uh, system calls are honestly the place that I always start my investigation of a system. And so much so that uh, I think, but I, I'm not gonna try, I think I could do this with my eyes closed, but I'm not gonna try it right now. So um, Dtrace is a command, you, you run it as root, I've, I've done a sudo bash, um, and it'll give you like a nice little useless Unix style help message. But if you do dtrace minus L, it'll show you all of the probes on your system. Um, so that's dtrace minus L. So this is everything from system calls to function calls in the kernel to, um, to user land, locking primitives and so forth. But right now, what we're gonna do is look just at system calls. So I'm gonna do dtrace minus L, minus N, syscall, colon, colon, colon. So in dtrace, um, all probes are divided into the provider, the module, the function, and the name. Uh, we have different providers, and in this case, we're using the system call provider. So I'm just gonna list out the system calls on this system. And again, uh, as I said before, a lot of these system calls start to feel pretty standard. Like, if I, if I scroll to the top, you'll see things like, oh geez, I have to scroll way up to the top at the latest version of Mac OS X. Uh, like things like unmount and statfs, things that you probably see on all these different types of Unix systems, pread. Uh, of course you get to, get to some like weirdo underscore underscore Mac get file. So OS X does things kind of its own way. Excuse me, Mac OS does things kind of its own way. All right, so that was just listing them and now I'm going to Remove minus L, do dtrace minus N, syscall, colon, 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 and print them out. And there were a thousand uh, entry and return probes. So this is kind of like if you could do S trace for everything on your system. And it's a mess of output. Um, someone I was talking to before the conference said it's like doing TCP dump over uh, an SSH connection where you're just getting this feedback loop. And that's exactly what we're getting here. Dtrace is making system calls, which is printing to the terminal, which is making more system calls, which is tracing more and more and more. Okay, great, so I can control C that. But I can see who all is making the system calls now. As I said, Dtrace is dynamic. It's dynamic in particular in that it allows you to see, uh, to choose what kind of information you're tracing. Rather than being static, more or less static, like S trace or this trace command, uh, it lets you trace what you want. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll trace the exec name, which is the name of the executable running. So if I do that and hit return, now it's gonna tell me that like Docker, I don't know why Docker is busy, but that's kind of interesting. Maybe we'll dig into that. Um, and I'm getting tons of drops. Okay, wow. Um, I, I always, I honestly always, now I've typed this command a million times and I always learn something new. Okay, so this was still kind of a mess of data and I said something earlier about how we're trying to limit the amount of data. And here's some of the places where I, I think Sysdig started or, or was looking over its shoulder at Dtrace in some of its design principles in terms of giving the user comprehensible answers. Here what I've done now is I'm using a primitive called an aggregation. It gives you a little key value from the, the key being here the executable name and the aggregating action to be account. For every uh, system call now, um, entry and return, it's going to tell me the name of the um, process executing the system call and the number of times it's done it. Now, when I hit Control C, it's gonna give me that output and that's a much more concise form. I can see like much more succinctly that you know, what, here are the process on the left uh, and the number of system calls on the right. And now I can dive down a little deeper and I assume everyone is interested in the same thing that I am on this screen. Yes, Docker? Is that what everyone wants to know? Okay, I'll just assume that the answer is yes. So now I can limit my, uh, my access using a predicate to just look at Docker. 
Let me explain what this is doing now. I'm, I'm honestly curious. I've never seen this before. So uh, exec name equals equals Docker. This might look like awk-like syntax to the, to the folks who raised their hand when they said they'd heard of Ultrix. Um, so awk-like syntax where you can say this is a predicate. Only do it in this circumstance. And now I'm looking at the probe function. Great. So now we get to see what Docker is doing on the system. I hit Control C. And it's doing this event QoS thing. That's very interesting. To my knowledge, it should be doing nothing. Um, so it's a little bit surprising that it's doing not nothing. So um, the final thing I'm going to do is limit my access to just the K event QoS um, uh, system call and then hope that my colleagues over at Apple have done a good job with user land stack traces and we'll be able to see where in the Docker process it's doing this. And I hit Control C. And now uh, I can pop open the, um, the, uh, the code for Docker and see where it is exactly that is invoking this. So what we've done is gone from a system-wide type of problem, you know, what, what's hitting system calls, to a particular stack trace that identifies within Docker where this generation of system calls is happening. And this is the kind of iterative approach that, that drove Dtrace. All right. Back to PowerPoint. DJs can do other stuff not associated with system calls, obviously, but I think system calls are, are the most important. And as we learned in that, from that first talk, provide these wayposts, these, these um, give you the right kind of granularity to understand what a system is doing. Now I'm going to step back for a second. I mentioned earlier that I spent a, kind of a long time at Sun. Um, so I wanted to just mention Java. Does anyone remember what the tagline for Java was maybe 20 years ago? Write once, run anywhere. And uh, it's, it, it's so kind of adorable. Like, wh what does it even mean now? Like, I, 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 can't, even, I can't even imagine what that, what that really reflects today. Um, and, and just I, I want to mention that they, they also kind of used the same kind of theme. It was the, kind of the write once name everywhere. So um, from a windowing system to a desktop to a management console and even the stock players, uh, they, they renamed Java, 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 and Java. Even the, the stock ticker was Java. And I'm just going, showing the lump there, not the, the deep crash. Anyway, but, the, um, but just write once anywhere, run anywhere. I want to put it in context. Because in 1996, when, when Java came out with this catchphrase and, and when it was really germane, like run anywhere actually meant something. Like it, it, it had some real significance. You had this cacophony of different server operating systems from True64, AIX, IRIX, Ultrix, I think, was no longer in vogue. And then you had this, this, again, this litany of different microprocessor architectures. You had this real complexity in the deployment environment. And it was a real challenge to figure out how you would write a program and how it would execute in someone's lab. Now, of course, there's a bit of this today, but it, it's, it's just very, it's very different. Um, so in 1996, the idea was that Java would in inject this new idea or this kind of new, this new, newly new idea, this, this, um, this retro idea of the virtual machine, and it would be able to sit above the fray. doesn't matter what operating system, doesn't matter which of these dead CPUs you're using, uh, it, it w you know, from, from Spark to Alpha to MIPS and, and so forth, it doesn't matter which of those you're using, uh, the JVM would solve all of those problems. Um, and of course... Uh, the, the phrase I learned as I was reaching, re researching this is that the people coined was write once, test everywhere, which what is what ended up happening. Um, but Java was only kind of half wrong here. And they were right about this idea of virtualization uh, being a, a key element to solving the problem of ubiquity. Uh, they were wrong that Java and it was going to be solved at a, at a language level. So write once, run anywhere like today. Like, basically, we just assume Intel. Intel everywhere, x86 everywhere. Um, like, the only other microprocessor architecture that I think people typically care about, of course, is ARM. But it, it's, it's pretty bifurcated in these environments. It's changing a little bit. You know, you're starting to see folks talk about ARM in the data center and ARM public cloud. And f folks with RISC-V are, are making a different kind of challenge there. But the, the landscape has gotten much simpler. Um, in fact, if WebAssembly was really just x86, 
it would mostly just be fine because you can kind of just assume whether if it's x86 and ARM, it's going to execute everywhere that matters. Um, of course, it matters even less because the everywhere is also Linux. Um, and this, this pains me as someone who worked on uh, different operating systems through the years. And oops, where am I going? Uh, and, but, but obviously, Linux is this ubiquitous operating system. You can assume Linux, x86, pretty much everywhere. I'm sure folks here, although they're maybe not raise their hand for it, have some Windows running in the server environment somewhere. Um, but it's still uh, an assumption you can make. And of course, uh, containers make that even more true, make it even more the case that the, this notion of run anywhere is, is even more quaint. Because if you just run inside of a container, you're, you're solving for, you're making assumptions that are generally true about instruction set architecture, around operating system, and then you know, just even around packaging and package management, all this stuff, it just solved for you. This, which makes this, this 1996 notion of write once, run anywhere, just really almost incomprehensible today. Um, so this, uh, this idea of the, the Linux system call layer has, has just gained such primacy. You've got um, container environments, even on your Mac and Windows. There you've got an embedded version of the Linux kernel executing those system calls, executing those environments. Uh, using virtualization. You've also got folks like the folks at Joyent who have taken a different operating system, their open Solaris derivative called the Lumos and SmartOS, um, who are deploying containers, but there they've done it by emulating this Linux system call layer. Um, we've gone from 1996, where there was this concaphony, again, of different environments, different operating systems, different instruction set architectures, to the Linux system call interface as perhaps the only interface that matters, like the level of abstraction at which now we are all operating. And this brings me to the end where I just want to observe that we, you know, looking back on system calls, we've got highly significant events, you know, as true 30 years later from Rodriguez's paper in 1986, where system calls tell you so much about the system, tell you uh, and, and provide it at the right level of granularity where it's not too much and not too little, but you can really understand at a high level what these applications are doing and today what your clusters of applications are now, are now doing. It's also a very well understood domain for tracers, well understood uh, domain for debuggers and um, a, a, something that's easy to latch on and to hold on to. And now we've moved into this era where Linux containers and the Linux system call interface has become this de facto ubiquitous standard that we can all assume in our processes. So um, this creates just absolutely the perfect environment for, for Cystic, where you've got the, the right kinds of elements to be traced in this interface that has now become ubiquitous and can be assumed in all of these different instances. All right, thanks very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. If there are questions, you can raise your hand. Yeah. We've got some mics. Uh, we are live streaming the event, so if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring one over to you. Yeah, question in the back. Hold on, hold on. We, we're live streaming, so. Hi there. Yeah. Um, are you going to update your slide deck on slideshare.net with the uh, missing yeah. bits? I'll, I'll not only um, share these slides, but. Um, the meticulously scanned and like tweaked images for, from that paper and from a couple of others that I cited, I'll, um, I'll put them on SlideShare, but I'll probably tweet them, you know, during the break or something like that at AHL. Yeah. Right here, Salute. I thought you would be talking a bit about how D-Trace is different from Sysdig, or is that later? Um, it's not later. So um, how D-Trace is different than Sysdig, great question. Um, so I'd say that uh, you know, w one of the, the big differences in Dtrace is uh, where and when it's intended to operate. Dtrace is, is always available in production, but it's not always enabled. The goal with Dtrace is to, to make sure that there is no impact when it's not being used, and then when it is being used, to, um, to, to have that impact scaled to the type of question that you're asking. That is to say, for, for the for the way you slow down the system to be proportional to that. And again, not always enabled. And one of the goals of Dtrace is to minimize the amount of data that's being pulled from the source, from data generation, 
to, um, to, to the edge, to where people are, are using it and consuming it and observing it. Sysdig, in contrast, I think is most useful when it's always enabled. So there's more optimization that can be done, or the, there's more optimization that has been done around to make sure that, that the, those pieces are efficient. There's also, um, Sysdig is more of a stream of data because the post-processing or the, the observability happens later in the, in the flow, where then your, your stream of data, and this reflects some of its origins from, from Wireshark, uh, or from, from Loris's background in Wireshark, you've got a stream of data that you're then paring down to answer questions about the system. It's also much more germane for distributed systems where Dtrace is focused on single system analysis. So those are some of the differences. Um, I'd also say that, uh, you know, again, I think one of the mo most salient ones is always enabled, not enabled, and then, um, you know, optimization, Sysdig has done great optimizations to minimize and make efficient, uh, execute like the, the, that stream of data, whereas Dtrace has done basically no optimization around uh, marshalling and unmarshalling data or uh, like a JIT for execution of its instrumentation because uh, of that difference in domain. And I think the key one being always enabled versus not. Just a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Would you briefly des describe the, the nature of the hooks that Sysdig uses and Dtrace uses? Um, you know, I'm going to talk about the, the hooks that Dtrace uses, but I'm going to leave the hooks that uh, Sysdig uses for someone who works at Sysdig and knows a little more about it than I do. Um, so what Dtrace does is uh, when you're not using Dtrace, it's a fully optimized kernel. There's kind of no, no differences in the way that it operates. But with system calls in particular, let's say you're enabling the open system call then very much, uh, you know, it goes from the fully optimized system call to replacing the pointer to, like, the, the function that is invoked when a system call happens to one that contains kind of an if tracing enabled, execute the system call, uh, if tracing enabled for the return. So it actually looks very similar to that 1986 paper, except for different, the difference between Ultrix trace and dtrace with regard to system calls. Ultrix trace always has those comparisons, those branches, uh, in the system call code, whereas Dtrace hot patches that code only when system call uh, execution or, pardon me, system call tracing is live. Great. And if anyone wants to hear me give kind of Dtrace war stories, I will do that all day during the breaks or, or whenever. All right, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>